Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, so I will speak today about research data management. My name is Anna Slavitz, and I'm a statistician. And I work as a consulting statistician at the uh, research institute, where one of my roles is to help other, um, other researchers with uh, um, data management, uh, data analysis, um, everything related to data. And um, I like to, to uh, have my lecture as interactive as possible. So I'm starting with some ice-breaking questions. Um, I don't know if um, you're familiar with Slido. So probably you all have a device, either a laptop or a mobile device. And if you just type in the browser, uh, the website, Slido, and then you enter this code, which is 4255813. And you will get to respond um, to three questions. For now, just the first question is open. What type of digital content do you generate in your research? So if you now, if you can take time and uh, open the website and you enter your response, after I s some time, I will switch uh, switch it to the second question and then to the third questions, and then we will look at the results. Um, and so the second question will be, what formats do you use to save your data? And where do you store your research, research data? There's, these are three questions that I also asked in uh, some previous lectures that I have. Um, and so this, so that we have all some um, some idea what we're talking about when we talk about data management. And in the classroom, so we are a big group. Um, so, so we have to keep it short, but I also like to get maybe um, some oral responses for you. So not just typing the, not just anonymously typing the answers on Slido, but I would also like to hear from you um, if everyone here would introduce themselves, but really shortly, focusing on maybe just the name and what research field they're on and current research project. For example, about myself, I would say my name is Anna, my um, research field is social science statistics, and my current research project is about um, using um, survey questionnaires um, to measure attitudes of users of buildings. And uh, in, I don't know if in which corner we could start, maybe in that side on the top, on the left. And if we go around and everyone has just a, a really, really quick um, intro about themselves. So name, research field, and current research project. I, um, not needed. <laughs> okay, so I've g we gathered also your responses on Slido, but now it will make some time for me to switch to Slido and screen and back. So maybe I will show you your responses at the end. I will for now show you just the responses from a previous um, previous lecture that I had. But I imagine the uh, responses will be very similar. So the question. Actually, I, can, I will compare on my mobile phone, phone, and I will tell you so how it compares to your responses. So the first question, what type of digital content do you generate in your research? And the most frequent response was tabular data. And let me see what happened in, in your case. Um, so let me see. Probably it will be the same. Uh, so view results. No, no, no. Actually, it's, it's different. We have, in your case, it's textual data on the top, so 63%. So know that multiple uh, responses were possible, but in this classroom, uh, almost two-thirds of you said that um, in your, your research, you generate textual data. And then tabular data is on the second place, followed by image data and then documentation and scripts, audio data, geospatial data, and then others. OK, um, next one. Uh, what formats do you use to save your data? Um, so here are the responses. I think in that case, yeah, it was 
yes, yeah, so it was uh, this was the list of options, and I, I'm quite, actually quite disappointed that people store data in Word files and uh, Excel files. But yeah, it's very typical that uh, people um, save data in Excel files. We will later on. Uh, talk about why that, that's not a good practice and what is better to use the comma separated value format, which is here in the third place, and then we have picture formats and so on. So let's see what what is in your case. So I had this one or two, I would say two years ago. So let's see what kind of responses we have here. And yeah, actually, it's quite similar also in your case. Word files on the first place, and then we have PDFs. And then we have Excel, and then we have the comma separated values, so the CSV file. OK, and the third question was, where do you store research data? So yeah, that was, that's a very important one. So let's see what you replied. Um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. So. It's, yeah, it's always the same, on your private computer. And today we will learn why that's not a good idea. But it's the most, no, actually here, no, actually here it's, um, on the slide it's better, it's on the work computer. Here we have on the private computer. Okay, but it's also different because you are not maybe employed at the university, so you don't, you don't, you're not in employment, so it's a different audience. Um, so you work as, with data as a student, and you have it, of course, on your personal computer because you're not employed by, your, by the university. Um, and then followed by cloud services, external hard, drive, hard drives, uh, private computers, and so on. So here um, on Slido, your responses were, uh, the, f the most popular one, 72% on, on private computer, followed by cloud service, 68%. Um, external hard drive, 52%. No, before that also work computer, 60%, and so on. Okay, so not, so um, the responses are more or less what I've predicted. And now let's go to talk about um, research data management. So this is like the outline what I will talk today. And I will start with presenting the research data life cycle. Then we will talk about the FAIR principles, which you probably already heard of, and openness, and then whose responsibility, at the end, very shortly, I will talk, this research data management, whose responsibility should it be? But first, what, actually, what is data? So probably when you were responding to my um, ice-breaking questions at the beginning, you were wondering, what actually is data? Um, and by definition, data refers to a set of values of qualitative or quantitative variables. Um, data is different from information, which is best illustrated by this example. So if we are measuring, we have the temperatures, uh, temperatures all over the world for the past 100 years, that is data. If we analyze this data and we find that the global temperature is rising, that's not data, that's information. So that is the difference between data and information. At the end, there is also a gram grammatical note. So uh, many of you are working with languages, so you probably also um, know about grammar. And um, when we speak about data, data is technically a plural noun that deserves a plural verb, so the data are ready. But because the word datum is not so commonly used, the word data is becoming a mass noun. So we can also say the data is ready. So um, saying the data is ready, so um, just a note that, uh, that when we talk about data, uh, we can also use uh, this format. And now the uh, research data life cycle. So what is research data management? Research data management describes the organization, storage, preservation, and sharing of data collected and used in a research project. It involves decisions about how data will be preserved and shared after the project is completed. Um, this, is a, um, big, uh, this is a figure I took from, um, from the data management uh, guide for librarians uh, from the University of California. Um, it's uh, one that I've seen used uh, in, a, um, in many other uh, uh, guides and documents. And um, 
where do you think, so as a researcher, which point, so this is a circle, where should you as a researcher start? So any idea where to start here in this cycle? Good one, so good response, research question. So I was thinking probably somebody will say data management plan because you, everyone says well, the first thing you do is a plan. No, so we don't start with the, with the plan. We first need to do some research before we are ready. Uh, to make a plan. Yesterday you were listening a lecture by Thea about the, uh, how to prepare a data management plan, but before you're ready to prepare the plan, you need to do some, uh, some research. So you need to have a research question and you uh, do a research of what are the existing databases, what is the existing knowledge about your research topic. And also that includes the data search. What are, these, what are the sources that you use? So there are like a lot of possibilities. So there is not one website you would go and find all the solutions. So where, so when I'm looking for data for my research project, this is where I usually start. I look at official statistics from national statistical offices, from Eurostat, um, from the international um, non-governmental organizations such as the United Nations, World Bank. Um, my field is uh, social science, so um, um, in my case, so I also look at the CESDA data co catalog uh, that has a lot of uh, previous uh, social science research, but also other fields that have, uh, they have data, their data repositories, but we also have the general purpose and institutional repositories. We will speak more about repositories later. Um, more generally, we have also the Google dataset search and so on, so many options. Um, does anyone have a source for looking for data that is not here? So previous data, so secondary data. Any, yeah? World Value Survey. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a survey. Uh, you would find uh, the World Value Survey in a research data repository. So you, it's in some of the repositories. So yeah, World Value Survey. Um, it's an important survey and uh, it's, um, the data are available for other researchers and you can find it um, in a repository. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, European Social Survey, yeah, also um, it, you can find it through the CESDA repository. Actually, I, in the past, that's like 10 years ago, I worked the European Social Survey so I'm quite sure so all the data is available online on their website and they have, it's accessible to the German um, uh, Gezi's um, archive and you can find that one through the CESDA data catalog. Um, any other source you would look for for data? ProQuest? So th that's a database for papers usually, right? Okay, published th theses. But it, and you find also data there, so data sets. So instrument, for example, like a survey, so questions and questions. So, so that you find that on ProQuest. Okay. Okay. That's so. That's also one one place to then search for data. Okay. Historical archive. Yes. Also. Also. Um, there are also some of them online, but also sometimes you need to go for data also to the physical archives and find the, um, the resources there. So yeah, libraries uh, even. Um, so that's uh, yeah, a great example. So another um, source of data, which is um, not necessarily in digital form. Sometimes is it analog form and then you have to digitalize it. Um, okay, so any other source of data? Kaggle? Uh -huh, Kaggle data set. That's, uh, I heard about it, but I forgot what it is. Um, mm -hmm. From various disciplines. So something similar to Google data set search? Okay, Kaggle. Okay, another one we have. Okay, now let's go. We have, we have looked uh, if there is some data, and you know, in a research project, it's not always necessary to collect your own data. Sometimes, you can do your thesis just based on data other people have collected. And um, I actually wish 
that was more most uh, more common because I think th it's a good um, from the sustainability perspective, you know, why collect, you know, collecting data, it's a lot of resources to invest, usually taxpayer money to invest in collecting something when you have so much data that already exists and it's not being used and it's a waste. So I don't have the exact numbers, but in one of the one lectures I attended a few years ago, it was a citation that I, I think about 80% of um, data that is collected is never used. So it's just collected, but nobody uses it. So, you know, it's a lot of waste. So why should you know, invest your energy in collecting data as a student, you know, um, when you can write your topic about something um, about that already, um, for, you to, for which you already have data, you know, you can just use existing data and it's then also less work for you because you don't need to collect data on your own. You can use existing data sets. So I think um, advisors should um, uh, advise their students to do that more often. So yeah, Thea. So to have more integrity. Yeah, so I completely agree with you. So data quality is, is a big problem. So when you're searching for data sets, you also need to be aware of the source. So if you are looking at the at the source like the Google data set search, you don't know what is in it because there is no editor who is like saying, we will take that or we will not take that. But if you have a trusted repository, we will later talk more about repositories, and a repository that has certificates, um, okay, we have repositories like, later we will speak about Zenodo, that just, they you know, you can upload data yourself and nobody's checking the quality if it's, if it's falsified and so on. But you have also trusted, uh, so before we had the global, uh, so the World uh, Value Survey, the European Social Survey and so on. Um, these are surveys that are actually, the quality of data is checked. So as a student, you're safe to use because these are data sets that are um, prepared by a team of experts and they have these uh, quality assurance processes. But it can happen also in that cases. I will not name names, but I know some very well-known um, surveys. And I was um, in a seminar about data falsification. And, you know, it's very dif difficult to do comparative research, so comparing different countries. And especially uh, from countries, from third world countries. And when you collect data, it happens that the data managers in that country, they have trouble collecting data. And they falsify data. So they... they you know, collect just a few responses and they just copy it. And in some, fa in some cases they do it really naively. And um, as somebody working with data, you review the data set, it's really easy to spot. So there are some really elemental mistakes that you can find looking at data and you see, oh, this is just repeating the same 10 rows over and over and over. So this you can find. But with modern um, computer science, you can falsify data. So you can create it in a random way but again, not too random, so that when somebody is looking at the data, it's really, really difficult to find it's falsified. So it's always a concern. Is this data really true? And for this reason, I, I, I agree. It's also, also important to collect new and new data sets because with the new data, you can verify and compare and you can find some patterns and then it's easier to spot this falsification if you collect more data. Yeah. So yeah. So as a researcher, so starting work uh, in um, um, so in any field, you have to be always aware, you know, that everything that you listen to. So you are, always need to question things. So who, which source I can trust, which source I cannot trust, because it's so easy to falsify data. So it's good to be cautious and to be aware. Uh, that not everything that's published is always correct. So there are there is a possibility of retractions and so on. Data management plan. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You will have in this summer school a lot of lectures about these ethics uh, and legal issues, and about the GDPR. So I think tomorrow you have a. Uh, two lectures about it, and uh, you can ask about this. But just to uh, to respond uh, quickly to this question, so GDPR is often seen, you know, as a limitation in research. Um, you know, it's in, um, it's uh, that it's limiting research, but it's actually not really true because you have. Uh, I will also have later a slide about the protection, but it's you know not 
limiting everything, you know. So you can still do a lot with data that is protected. You can still share the data. You just need to anonymize it first, and then you can share it. So it's some work, but it's not, you know, really preventing everything. So the GDPR, um, even if GDPR exists, um, still you can share the data. Just before sharing, you need to remove things that can make it identifiable. That, of course, limits some kind of research, but most of the research purposes, most of the research questions related to that data can still be answered. So, of course, yes, GDPR is a limitation, but, you know, it's not a 100% limitation. And it, there are ways to not, I would not say work around that, but there are ways to live with it. And uh, tomorrow we will have lec lectures focused on exactly that topic. But now, um, um, because we don't have uh, more time and we have still a lot of topics to talk about, I would like to now move to the next phase, data management plan. Actually, this is a topic you listened about uh, yesterday. Uh, 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 Theo had a lecture. And you will have two more about data management plans. Um, so I will just say data management is just a plan so that you write at the beginning of it's a document that you write before your research, and it's a living document because you know you cannot plan everything in advance. So during your research, maybe some things change. You can always update and make a new version of the data management plan. So don't worry uh, when you're writing the data management plan because it's not the final version. You know, it's a living document, and the purpose of the data management plan is to help you. It's not a it's not a bureaucratic thing to to stop you. It's something to help you. And uh, so from me, enough now about data management plans. Next, oh, sorry. Next, uh, yeah, description. OK. So the phase of describing data. Um, there are many things uh, here to cover. Um, so when we have data, in addition to data, we have metadata, which is data about data. Um, so because these data. Uh, to have, for data to have value, they need to be described. So if we want somebody to be able to reuse our data, it's really important that uh, the user of data knows what this data is about. And that is just not a matter of a couple of sentences. That is, of, that is a matter of having good documentation, good metadata. So, um, so how to describe data? Uh, first, the source of data. We already talked about you know the different sources of existing data. Uh, we have the primary data collection where you, as a researcher, collect your you collect your own data, and you, we have the reuse of secondary data, so the data sets that already exist. Even if you are reusing secondary data, you still need a data management plan because you're still dealing with data. Even if somebody else collected it, you're still managing it with some rights that you have about for it, and still you need. Even if it's not your data, you didn't collect it, you still manage it. It's so even if case of using other sources, data management is important. The description of data involves what type of data, what format, what volume of data, the standards and methodolo methodologies used uh, to create or uh, to create the data, uh, the structure and name of files, versioning, quality, quality assurance processes, and so on. Um, I will now jump. I made a selection of topics related to the description of data that I think are important, so I cannot cover everything because I don't have so much time. Um, so what I want to cover is the data collection. So when we say data collection, so when we talk about collecting data, um, it's need to, you need to be aware, so as a researcher scientist, that there are like two types of data. We have data that we design. For example, you are in chemistry, um, and you do a scientific experiment. And if you're a social scientist, usually surveys are not experiments, of course. They're like a quasi-experimental design because you are designing the form where people respond. So it's not, it's not something natural, a survey. It's something that you design in a, as a researcher following some standards. So you are, it's, you are, uh, so this is because survey com um, data coming from surveys, it's, it falls under design data, the same as experiments. But also, especially nowadays, we have so many information out there online, administrative data, transactional data, where you are not, uh, where there is no active 
data collector, like from the researcher, uh, researcher standpoint, you're not collecting the data, but this is just data that exists. So you are doing an analysis of online websites. And there are so many online websites online, and you are doing an analysis of their content by scrapping the data. That's, you know, that's some data that is passively be, uh, being created by other people, by users, and you are, as a researcher, you step in and you analyze the content. So what people post online and so on. Somebody mentioned that you're researching gossip, so you're interested in how people gossip on Twitter, and that's some that's transactional, that's passive data that's being created online, and you as a researcher um, can scrap the data online, and you then manage it, and you form it in a data set that you use. You write a paper, or you write a thesis based on it, and you also have a research data set coming of it. So um, be aware of this distinction. When you think about your data, is are you the one that is designing the data, or is just the, this organic data. Um, and so when you're dealing with data, so this is one, one thing, um, uh, one aspect of data, so when we are describing data. Um, then another thing is the types of uh, data, uh, recommendations for formats. So in the beginning, in the ice-breaking questions, we had this question about the formats of data. The most popular one is the, um, usually is the tabular. In your case, it was not the tabular data, but it was the textual data. Um, uh, so a lot of you analyzing text. Um, but also we have other formats. And um, um, when you are... Um, when you're analyzing data, you're using certain form, uh, pro computer programs, certain formats. Um, one of the most popular, for example, for documents, so the Word format, um, the Excel format, and so on. But when you are managing data and preparing, especially when you're preparing it for it to be shared with others, there are formats that are just uh, they're acceptable and there are formats that are recommended. Recommended because they are more in line with the principles of good data management. Um, because um, um, we have uh, formats that are proprietary and are controlled by a private company. And that company can change that format and you don't have control. And then there are non-proprietary formats which um, are not owned by companies. So when you sh share the data in the formats, also later versions, later programs, it, that data can be opened by more, uh, more, more programs. So uh, when you save your data for others, you need to consider which is the best format so the other people, so myself in five years, or another person who will be using that data, um, what program they will be using. Because maybe they will not be using the same program as me. So if you analyze your data in Excel, which is for me, some people will say, you know, it's not a good practice to analyze data in Excel, but I think it's a good program. So a lot, of course, a lot of people use it, but please don't don't share your uh, files in the XLS format because that's a not, not a good data management practice. A good data management practice is to save it in a computer separate values format because that way also people using other kinds of programs can work with your data. With some handling, they can open also your Excel file, but it's a lot of work for them. So just um, having this more simple and more uh, versatile version, the computer separate values, you can make an improvement. So this is just one example. I will not go into detail for everyone. Uh, you can read a really good resource about that is the UK data service. So you can read uh, more about uh, that there. Um, so yeah, the most popular uh, form is the tabular data, where you have some entities and the attributes. Um, when we talk about what metadata is, um, the metadata also always includes the list of attributes. So what are these characteristics uh, that we're interested in? So for example, we have here example of three countries and their population, their area, year of entry to the European Union. Um, so these are attributes and these are the different entities. Um, 
and uh, so when we are describing the data, it's important to list what are the different it attributes, what are the list of values. So for population area and the area, it's very simple because you know it can be like any number. Um, but for the year of entry, you know it's just some range of values that's possible. Uh, many of you are from social, social sciences, and if you are doing um, surveys, you have survey questionnaires where you have already when somebody writes and designed the questionnaire um, in advance, uh, the questionnaire as a document, it's part of the metadata about the research project, and it already defines in the data sets what the possible values for it. If you have a Likert uh, type question with five responses, you have then um, this attribute that has five numbers, that's the range of values. Okay, you have then some code reserved for the missing value and so on. So all these questions, all these issues, this is all data. When you're doing that, that is data management. So this making decisions about it, um, storing the data, preparing the description. So this, all, this is all part of the, when we talk about documentation and metadata, that's, part, that's an important part of it. Um, defining what an entity is and so on. Um, and how this, you know, there are many ways how to shape a table. And uh, usually this relational data model is the most popular, but you can also have others. You can uh, have a hierarchical organization of data network, uh, organization of data object. So there are always many, many options. So at the end, you know, um, sometimes if your project is very co uh, complex data-wise. Maybe you as a researcher from the humanities and you don't have so many data skills, it's always good to have somebody to help you with these kind of issues um, because it's not always easy to know the responses uh, to, to how to manage and deal with data. Um, data analysis. Um, I know you heard about the Pareto principle, but this is simple to the uh, previous statistic that I gave for research data that, you know, of all the research data that it exists, 80% of it is never used, just 20% is, so this 80-20 rule. Um, when you're working with data, always know that 80% of the time you will spend for data cleaning and organizing it. Even if you're not collecting it, if it's data from other sources, a lot of time is spent for that. Just Usually just 20% is left to actually perform the analysis of uh, data. Um, and yes, so in this process of analyzing and working with data, you create a lot of documentation, metadata. As I said, the metadata is data about data. And uh, it includes also uh, simply the persis persistent identifiers, such as the DOI. I'm sure uh, Thea yesterday talked about it. Um, publication date, it's also data about data. The title, author, descriptions, keywords, license, funding, related identifiers. But also the things I mentioned on the previous slide. So what are the attributes? What methodology was used? What kind of, um, if you were doing a survey, what, ki what kind of questionnaire? Um, how, and so on. So all this is part of the documentation and metadata. Uh, the documentation may also include that details on the methodology used, analytical and procedural information, definition of variables, vocabularies, units of measurement, assumptions made, the format and file type of data. And existing community metadata standards for different fields, you have them. Um, and this is um, Research Data Alliance has a, has a good directory for different fields where you can find the metadata schemes. So uh, uh, Dublin Core is a very um, it's a very is one that's very general, general and it, it can apply for any discipline. But in every discipline, you have some specifics that cannot be covered by such general um, standards. So we have discipline-specific uh, standards. For example, in social sciences, for surveys, we have this DDI standard, um, this kind of standard that you follow. Um, I don't know what are the standards for other disciplines, but you can use this Research Data Alliance metadata directory where you can always find what are the um, metadata, metadata standards. So what what data about my data is needed to properly describe it. And why is this important? Because 
if we, so this summer school is about open science. So if we want to be an open scientist, so a scientist that is able co to collaborate with researchers from other dis disciplines, uh, from other institutions, you have to work in a way that what you produce, including your research data, so is, is, can be used by others. And if you want your work, your, so the Excel file that you work with where you enter your data, something that, that if, you can, if you want to make it something that can be used by others, you need to be, f you need to be following good data management um, recommendations. And one of them is always have rich metadata. So uh, having rich metadata, um, having a very detailed description of what the data is about. And this is something that is very, it's field specific. So you need to do the work for your field yourself to research what is uh, good metadata standards for your field. And then we, ha we, we come to archiving the data. So as I mentioned, we will be talking about the repositories. So what is a repository? What is an archive? Where are your many um, information scientists here. So you um, probably know already something with this. But so in general, a repository, like in general, is just a place where some re where records are stored. And archive is just a type of repository. Um, and but uh, the two terms are often used interchangeably. Um, and we t when we talk about research data repositories, um, we have like three types. We have general purpose repositories. Have you already heard about uh, or used uh, Zenodo or Fixture? Any users of Zenodo? Or Fixture? So nobody is using that? Okay. And then we have the institutional one. Do you use your, inst your institution or your school There is a repository? Usually you have one for research thesis um, where they're published. So not just data, but also dissertations. Um, is this something that you have used or you, you know? Okay, not every institution has a repository. The Uni University of Maribor has one. And then we have the domain-specific repositories. Um, and this website, Retree Data or, um, or a Girl Registry, is a good resource if you want to find a repository specific for, for your field. Um, so these are places where you can safely store um, data, data and share it with others um, for a def definite uh, time period. Or, um, but they really differ. Uh, between themselves, but in like um, just in general, so the main difference between the general purpose, purpose and the institutional repositories compared to the domain-specific ones, what is the advantage of you using one or the other? Um, it's very simple process to just upload the data you collect to a general purpose repository. Nobody's checking the data quality. Nobody's checking if what you collected is true. You just upload it there, you get a DOI, and you can share it with everyone. It's very quick, um, minimal work. So, But the problem is that the metadata scheme is very general. So the data is not um, for others to be used. Um, you cannot really describe it properly. Um, so the data. The metadata is not very rich, um, and data is not reusable. Uh, it's not very reusable without rich metadata and documentation. So that's why it's usually better to use domain-specific repositories. Um, for example, before we've talked about the survey research, um, and we have uh, the uh, truth says that uh, we have uh, different repositories, uh, data archives with a specific metadata standard. Um, that it's very commonly used, and in that case, um, you can store a lot of information about your data, and it's then very reusable because the people who want to use it uh, can know what um, what the data is about. But the problem is that in many fields you don't have that, and it's really time-consuming to prepare a repository like that. 
We also, in some cases, there is a review, you know, they don't just upload everything, they do some quality assurance, and that's really time consuming to prepare, but also to publish. Um, it's not something that's published instantly, so that's a lot of issues. And also it requires specific skills. Okay, enough about the repositories and archiving, now we go to the publication. Um, have you heard about the Creative Commons licenses? Okay. Um, so, um, we have these uh, Creative Commons licenses. With, um, w so, when you publish something, you publish it with a license that, uh, for the user, so which tells them what they can do with the data. And here they are from the most free to the least free. Um, actually, the most free is missing. The most free is the CC0. Do you know what CC0 is? Anyone knows? Um, uh, CC0 is public domain. You, you have a data file and you share it in public domain and you lose all the rights you have towards it. So there are uh, websites, for example, you have a website like Free Images and Splash and so on, where you have images taken by photographers and they don't have any rights. So you can use that photo. You can see in my presentation I used many photos, but I didn't cite an author. Usually, in some, for some pictures in my presentation, like here, I list the source. I got these pictures from Wikipedia. But they had also many pictures with, where I didn't list the source. And do you think I just randomly took them from Google search? No. I, I searched for pictures that have a CC0 license, which means I can use them, and I don't need to cite where I got that picture from. That's public domain. Would you publish your data in public domain? So you are a researcher, you collect your data, and you want to be an open science, uh, you want to, um, to do your research in line with the open science principle. So would you just publish your data set online for everyone to use without citing you? Maybe, why not? But usually that's not the case. Usually um, when, when uh, you publish your data, you pu um, ideally you publish it with the CC BY in, um, attribution, so you ask people then to, to cite you. And that's also important also for tracking, you know, for um, so that um, as a user of data, it's important because, th as Thea mentioned previously, uh, there is this issue of um, can we trust the data? So if he, the data has this CC BY license, so somebody is cited, you know the source who collected the data. Um, and then there are more strict, more strict ones. We have the attribution share alike, which means, yes, you can use my picture or my, date, my data, my paper, but um, not only you need to cite me, you also need um, to publish it with the same license as I used, so the share alike. It can be used with, this same, uh, with the co comparable license. Um, then we have a more restrictive one, no derivatives. Yes, you can use my data, but you cannot make derivatives from it. But, you know, the more we go down, so no commercial use and so on, uh, you would say, of course, you know, I collected my data with, with the public money, and now I'm publishing this data, but I don't want to, I don't want to uh, make commercial companies to use it, you know, because it was made with public money, and now they can make profit from it. So I will say non-commercial. But in spirit of open science, that's not really good, actually. It's better to, ha to not, if not ne really necessary, to not use this restriction of non-commercial uh, non use, because, you know, sometimes, you know, the companies, they don't have always, you know, okay, they make profits, but they don't, or they don't do bad things. They want to do to develop a new, you know, uh, a new medicine uh, to be used for people, and that thing is doing good. And because they don't, they cannot use your data, they will be not able to develop a medicine that can save lives, for example, uh, because you restricted the use, and they cannot use your data. So this, like, example that I'm making is very exaggerated, but you know, uh, just to understand. So when you're deciding how to license your data, 
and how you want to restrict it, you need to be thinking, you know, if I restrict it too much, maybe I'm preventing something good. Um, but all these, you know, ethical and legal issues um, are the top. Um, there will be lectures uh, in the next day, so the one after me, and then two lectures tomorrow about ethics and legal ethics, uh, ethical and legal issues, uh, where you will talk about more about uh, these kind of issue, issues. At this point, maybe I would like to make some comments. They don't relate just to the publication phase of the of the, so the publishing of data, they relate to the whole cycle of uh, managing data. Um, so just three points I want, so just three notes about this I want to make. Uh, one is, so if you, uh, many of you are uh, in social sciences and hum humanities, so doing research that involves human being, also the ones in medical sciences, um, who work with human beings, it's really important to be aware of this personal data um, and also of um, that it's ethical to obtain informed consent for data collection, but not only for data collection, but also for the processing and long-term long preservation. Um, in the past, I used to work for a data archive, and uh, we had a problem, a very common problem, of, uh, that researchers, when they were collecting their data, um, they didn't, so they wrote, they were doing a survey, and in the survey information, they promised um, this, your data will be only used for this research project, you know, because there is, it's really important uh, to, um, for uh, respondents to be made, to be felt, so that they feel safe, uh, that nobody will misuse their data, and they, will, they promise you, we will not use this data for anything unrelated to this project. But that's a problem, because you as a researcher, ethically, if you want to be ethical and interdisciplinary, working with others, um, enabling open science, you need to share the data. But you cannot share the data because you promised your research subjects that you will not share it. So when you when you collect the data, so if it's a survey, in the survey intention, you don't, don't, don't be too strict um, about how you will use the data. You need to mention, so if you later on, if you want to archive this data, you have to tell your research subjects, you know, at some point, this data, because of open science, you cannot, so in the general public, people don't know about open science and these kind of things. So you cannot use the same terminology as we use here, but you need to make you need to say them in a language that it's understandable to them. So usually in my research, I tell them um, this research will be also made available to other researchers from other research fields or something like that. So your respondents, they need to be aware that because that at some point also others, or you can say my data will be also used by others for research and educational purposes. You can also mention commercial purposes uh, and so on. So, but as a research, sub research subject, they need to be aware of that, that their data will be used. Because what will happen when you archive the data, you don't have the consent, you have the consent for collecting the data and for doing your publications, but you don't have the consent for processing it and sharing it in a repository. So that's really important. Um, another uh, thing, yes, yeah, so before we, we had this issue about the GDPR and so on, so, and I said I will mention it. So, you know, um, personal data, you know, when you share your data, you have, need to remove all the um, direct and non-direct identifiers. Um, this process is called pseudo-anonymization or anonymization, so need, you need to change some of the variables. So you lo lose some information, so the data loses something, but still with that when you make it, when you restrict it, you make it more shareable, because if you didn't do that, you would have problems because of the um, data privacy legislation. Um, and then you have another option. So, when, you know, sometimes, you know, if you're doing focus groups, is any one of you doing focus groups or interviews, recording interviews? Okay. And when you're doing an interview, what your, da your data is the transcript of the interview. That's your data. 
But you know, the data contains many personal information. So the transcript, you cannot just upload it somewhere. It's um, so, but if you can still share it, but you can anonymize it, that's one option, but sometimes that's not possible and really restricts the value of it. So there you have also the option of restricting the access. So when we say open science, it doesn't always mean it needs to be open to everyone in the world. So you can make the restrict to researchers who are doing research and need that data, and they need to make a proposal. So sometimes to get access to specific data, researchers need to ask and motivate. I'm doing research about that, and this is why I would need to read your transcripts. And your transcripts are deposited in, uh, they are in a repository, but not everyone can access it. So people need to, first of all, they need to have a user account, and then they ask permission to get it, and they make a request, and they, then their request is granted or not. And uh, it can be granted by the researcher or maybe the archive. So somebody needs to make then the decision. So there are rules who can access the data and who not. So restriction of access. So this is the third point I wanted to make uh, regarding the ethics and leg uh, legal compliance. But more about these issues you will uh, listen in other lectures. Okay, and now we finally came to the topic of the fair data principles. So you heard about the fair data principles yesterday, but before yesterday, have you heard about them? Or it was the yesterday the per first time? Who of you uh, heard about the fair data principles before yesterday? Okay, some of you have. Okay, so let's talk about the fair data principles. I'm leaving them to the end, so first I start thought about starting with them, but no, because actually, the fair data principles, the concepts, the co as a concept, um, it's not so new. It's from 2016. So in 2016, I published my doctoral dissertation. So when I was do as a, when I was a doctoral student, there were, nobody was talking about the fair principles. I never heard this term when I published my dissertation. But this doesn't mean that what I so the data management, so the managing data in line with fair principles existed even before that, just it didn't, it didn't have a ma name. So fair data principles, this is just a name given for some, for things that are actually not so new, uh, things that have been done also previously, they are not so new. This is just a, a term used to describe those principles. And actually, in my first part of the lecture, I was already speaking about the fair principles. I just didn't name them. And now that we already listened to the first part, we will reflect what they actually mean. So the fair, it's really catchy because, you know, it has this connotation of fairness, of doing, of justice, and so on. And what it actually means. So the F is findability. Metadata and data are easy to find for both humans and computers. So you would think that it's trivial, but no. So it's really important, both humans and computers. Sometimes it's not possible, especially in the hum humanities. It's not uh, always easy to make the data findable also to computers. But if you really want to improve um, and go into this direction of, uh, of open science, it's really important to try. So because uh, humans me it means, uh, being assessed, uh, fi uh, so be being find, found by humans, it's a lot of work. If things can be, if data can be found so also by computers, that speeds the process of science really quickly. So it's really important to work also the, on this computer findability part. Accessibility. Uh, users need to know how they can ac uh, access data, possibly including authentic 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 authentication and authorization. Um, when we talk about accessibility, um, it's important to know that accessibility doesn't equate openness. It's not the same thing. So if we make data accessible, doesn't mean that it's open to everyone. It just means that there is this procedure and that the user knows what is the procedure to get the data. But it's not, it doesn't mean that it's completely open. It just means that it's 
transparent what this procedure is. So previously I mentioned that sometimes to get data you need to make, like write a proposal to get that data. Or you need to log in, so sometimes you need to have a user account, sometimes you need to be a professional researcher. Data is available only to those who are researchers by profession, and so on. So this is accessibility. Interoperability. Um, data can be integrated with other data in applications or workflows for analysis, storage, and processing. To improve interoperability, uh, related to interoperability, um, uh, related to that, it's really important to note when I talk about the formats, how um, when you work with data, it's really important um, to think about other users that they are not using the same programs and they are not doing the same thing as you. So to make data interoperable, you, may, you make it that it is more uh, fluent, it can more easily uh, connect with other data and so on. So that, it's the, that you improve the connectivity of data with other data sets, with other applications and so on. And the reusability. Metadata and data should be well described, so as I mentioned earlier, so that they can be used in different settings. So having rich metadata, um, we, meaning uh, a lot of metadata, a lot of documentation, so that if anyone is using the data, um, understands it. Okay, and now I have um, the specific, I will, um, we don't have so much time, so I will just quickly go, uh, so I will just um, go through, I will not go into the detail for each one. You see, interoperability, like a puzzle, it, uh, and the reusability, so that it can be reused by others, but not only by others, also by you. And because this is a summer school about open science, so fair, open, how do the, these terms relate? How are they different? So open data is not the same as fair data. Open data can be freely used, modified, and shared by anyone for any purpose. Um, it includes two types of openness, legal openness and technical openness. And um, it's important to know that FAIR is not open. And in open science, um, um, there is this saying that it needs to be as open as possible, but not completely open, and as closed as necessary because of data protection. So keep this in mind, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. And this is something that you do in the data management plan. You decide how much open it will be and how much closed. And this Venn uh, diagram is useful to understand the difference. So um, you have, you can, you, data can be only fair, they can be only open, or they can be both open and fair. Ideally, your data is open and fair, but that's not always possible. Um, having, but in terms of in open science, I think it's more important that data is fair than that data is open, because sometimes there are really valid reasons why the data cannot be open. Um, so it's more important that it's findable, accessible, interoperable, usable, than the. So if we need to decide between the two, fairness is more important than openness uh, for open science. Okay, so um, if somebody here is a biologist, environmental science, they will not like this analogy because a pond is also a very nice uh, ecological system and it has also its um, importance for nat nature and the environment. But let's make this analogy so if we have unmanaged data and managed data, if your data is not nicely managed, it's like you're in this swamp and you cannot it's not easy to move around, it's not easy to find things, and so on. If it's organized as a lake, it's more flow, and so on. And it has more added value, it's more timely, more robust, and so on. So the more somebody is into biology, the more they will dislike this analogy, probably. <laughs> they are saying yes. And, uh, but you know, it's really common in information, so as some of you are mentioned, uh, are, you are from information science, and in information science it's really popular to compare data to lakes and swamps, so we have data swamps, data lakes, they really like these analogies. So I thought about using it. 
Um, yeah, so broken or no data management, you are swamped, economically can not much to do. Meta domain management, you have a lake, you can have a lot of tourism around the lake and so on. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really, yeah. So from the perspective of human, it's like better to have a leg, but if you are a bacteria, of course you will like the swamp more. <laughs> Productive, yeah. So, and actually, you know, maybe sometimes having data that is not so well managed, because managing data takes you a lot of time, time that you could spend on producing like really completely new data sets that maybe in 200 years there will be a technology uh, able to use and clean that data so that researchers will not be using 80% of the time to clean the data. They will just use 20% time to clean and 80% to do the actual analysis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it, it all comes around to science, you know, from which research field you look something on. So the, from the computer scientist perspective, the thing on the right is better. So from if you are a biologist, of course, the one on the left is better. But yeah, so um, um, it's in many cases not a good analogy, but like really like uh, on a really, let's say, a shallow level, um, it's just of, ha of having these things managed or things ha having things that are not managed. Um, and whose responsibility should be that? So, you know, that's a lot of work, managing the data, describing everything. Who should be doing that, you know? This is really a lot of work. You're a researcher, you have many responsibilities. Usually you're always you're teaching, you're working on several projects, you have administrative duties, you have to sit in meetings, you have to, I don't know. So you all, you're all very busy. And this one thing, and the other thing is also you don't have the knowledge, you know, you didn't learn about data, uh, you didn't study something where somebody would teach you how to actually deal with data, you're not an information scientist. So sometimes your project is very simple and you don't need a lot of knowledge to manage your data, but sometimes your, data, your project is very complex and you need help. And in, later, in the later years, it's... Um, this is coming to coming to inten intention to also to university administrators uh, that researchers cannot do it themselves. And um, there are some examples of good practices of universities employing people, or at least having volunteers um, who help researchers uh, with issues related to data. Um, and so um, there's here are some links with. Uh, with these good practices, what they're doing um, in these cases. Um, so, and there is this emerging, um, emerging new role of research data stewards who advise, who adv support and train researchers in research data management. Um, but there are some universities that are investing in that, universities that are not doing anything, are leaving everything to to researchers, but you know, the European Commission in Horizon projects, they require, they're always requiring more and more in terms of open science. Um, now you need, if you want to, uh, if you have a Horizon project, if you want, if you publish something, it needs to be in open access. Um, for uh, regarding data, for now, I think the only thing that now they require is that you have a data management plan. They don't say you need then this one said you need to publish your data in a repository, but in 10 years, maybe um, they will be more strict about that. So it's really good to start now in invest in this because um, the European Commission is in the, is, wants open science, and to have open science is really important that everyone is doing good data management and that they're doing it in line with fine principles. Now they're only talking about that and saying this is really important, they're inv investing in training, in education, so that everyone gets in line what this is. But in 10 years, maybe you will, uh, you will not be able to conclude the research project 
if you will be not if you will not uh, if your research outputs will not be in line with the FAL principles. So yeah, it's really important to learn. Um, here I also include also two, they're not the only two, but two that I know of uh, uh, schools for research data science. Um, uh, this CODATA RDA, is what, uh, I attended it in 2019. Uh, it's a summer school for research data stewards. Uh, it was a pilot school, first time they organized it for uh, Research data stewards, and later I, it came to my attention that other um, institutions are doing it. For example, in Austria, the University of Vienna, but on, not only Vienna, only also Graz, uh, they did courses for data stewards. So in many places, this is happening now. So pay attention to that. Um, yeah, here just a list of different organizations and resources to come to if you have questions about research data management. There are many more, of course. And now we have, yeah, no, we don't have <laughs> time for uh, some maybe discussion. But we have also some discussion in between, so probably 